Hello and welcome to video number three of our mini prep buffer mixing series, the one where the reagents cross over from kinda dangerous to melt your flesh off in chunks nasty. To recap, these protocols were handed down to us on fragile parchment from the library of Coleman, who himself translated them from the ancient runes inscribed on openwetware.org. Your third mini prep buffer is the neutralization buffer, which uses a powerful chaotropic salt to precipitate out all the things we don't want, while keeping our plasma DNA and other small DNA molecules in solution. This is considered the major separation step, as we'll be removing chromosomal DNA, cellular debris, and SDS from the solution. This will also denature your RNAs, so be sure to leave enough time for it to break up all the RNA. We used to only leave 2-3 minutes for lysis before adding this buffer, with a predictable result of highly RNA contaminated purifications. Now, we let the lysis buffer work for 10 minutes. When you add the neutralization buffer, the effect is immediate and viscerally satisfying. A thick precipitate will jump right out as the cryotropic guanidine salts freeze the lysed cellular material from its hydrogen bonds. Did you know that a lot of your day-to-day -day bodily functions rely on hydrogen bonds being able to function? Needless to say, spilling a chaotropic salt or solution on your skin will be a seriously unpleasant experience. Reading the MSDS for guanidine hydrochloride explains that exposure to the skin, eyes or lungs will lead to acute toxicity, with the mystifyingly spooky stipulation that the target organs are the bone marrow and nerves. Personally, I treat guanidine salt like a live rattlesnake, so I'm yet to experience these effects personally, and I'd prefer it if I never do. Even once buffer N3 is mixed, you're going to want full PPE. Be sure to work in a well-ventilated area for the entirety of this mixing protocol. A fume cupboard is best, but an air-conditioned space will suffice. Gloves, lab coat and glasses are a must for the mixing and usage of this buffer. Wear a face mask if you want to be especially cautious. I mean, you should probably wear this stuff all the time, but I want to emphasize to you when it's really, really important. Like Asap's line in the mouse, familiarity breeds complacency. Next on our list of dangerous substances is glacial acetic acid, the key word being glacial. It's a lot stronger than vinegar. Another extremely corrosive compound, be extremely wary and continue to wear your full PPE. If you choose to dilute the acid to make pH balancing easier, be sure to follow the nursery rhyme and add the acid to the water. The next section is only necessary if you are unable to attain potassium acetate salt and need to mix a solution of potassium acetate yourself. If possible, save yourself the handling of the following substances by purchasing potassium acetate salt. While you should still wear your full PPE, it is only a minor irritant to skin and eyes. For those too poor or too hardcore to take the easy route, our last ingredient is potassium hydroxide, which will cause severe skin burns and eye damage and is harmful to aquatic life. This is a good time to note that you should have a liquid waste container on hand for the disposable of mini prep solutions. Keep your mini prep waste away from your regular liquid waste container. The presence of chlorine makes this halogenated waste. The wrong chemical added to your mini prep waste might result in the release of toxic chlorine gas. Take care you don't turn your lab into the western front of World War I. Find a waste disposal company that can dispose of chlorinated waste. Don't be a tosser. Back to how nasty potassium hydroxide is, the addition of water is extremely exothermic, so you may need to cool the vessel while dissolving your pellets. According to the MSDS, potassium hydroxide can spontaneously combust if moisture gets into the bottle, so screw that up tight and don't spill water in there. Let's get on to mixing this 100ml solution. As usual, we'll show you the equivalent quantities for a 1 litre stock, but keep in mind you're going to need a lab full of people to use that much before the buffers expire. If you're a small lab on a budget like me, be sure to mix a smaller quantity. A 4.2 molar solution is a lot of salt, as you're about to see, and it's not the cheapest ingredient. Starting with 50 mils of sterile purified water, we will start to slowly add 40.125 grams of guanidine hydrochloride to a beaker. This dissolution is very endothermic, and without a heated stirrer can take a very long time. However, by gradually heating to no more than 60 degrees while gently stirring, this will take a lot less time. Keep the entire process as far away from your body as possible, and don't go peering over the beaker to see why it's taking so long. Don't give up. I promise you'll eventually be able to dissolve the entire quantity of salt. Patience is a virtue with this step. Now, if you have pre-prepared potassium acetate salt, simply add 8.84 grams to your beaker of guanidine hydrochloride solution. For those who don't, 
Let's take a detour to prepare the potassium acetate. Switching from endothermic right onto the exothermic reaction, I'd recommend you find a nice ice box to submerge your beaker containing 10 ml of purified sterile water. Add 5.045 grams of potassium hydroxide very slowly. If you chuck it in all at once, it'll make a terrible hissing noise and I've heard it might catch fire. Needless to say, a patient scientist is a safe scientist. The ice will help speed up the dissolution, but is not strictly necessary, so feel free to give it a cautious stir with a well-gloved hand once everything is settled down. Ugh, seriously dude, cover your wrists. I think our lab needs elbow-length gloves to keep this dude safe. Ah, time to bring out the pH meter. As before, getting the pH right is much more important than getting the salt correct to the fifth significant figure. Using a pipette, transfer glacial acetic acid from a clean beaker into your reaction volume. You may be getting close to your maximum volume, so be careful not to go too far or the dilutions will all be thrown off. It's going to take at least 5 ml of glacial acid, so you can start adding pretty fast at the start. Once you reach the buffer zone for this reaction, it can proceed frustratingly slowly. Keep adding drops of acid until the pH finally reaches 4.8. If you overshoot, cautiously add a tiny bit of potassium hydroxide to bring it back up. I won't tell your supervisor if you don't. She'll be right. We can now mix the two solutions together and use sterile purified water to bring them up to the final volume. We're pretty sure that N3 is one of the longest lasting buffers, potentially lasting years. We're planning an experiment to better determine this, but if you've got anecdotal info about the expiration of N3, we'd love to read about it in the comments. There is no need to autoclave this, nature is yet to find a way to coexist with this toxic solution. I'd still recommend you keep the stock bottle in the fridge to preserve its life, and simply aliquot 15 mils into a sterile falcon tube to be left on the bench for immediate use. That about does it for us today. All recipes were taught to us by Dr. Nicholas Coleman at the University of Sydney, who found them at openwetware.org. I'm also going to link a fantastic set of lecture notes that I found helpful in confirming my suspicions of the roles of each buffer. The author is uncredited, but it is published by the University of Illinois at Chicago, aka UIC. I'll link it in the description, but this is a good reminder to always brand your content, fellas. BIOFOUNDRY! And that's the first of the two guanidine buffers. Join us next time when we up the ante and mix a 5 molar solution of guanidine hydrochloride. And you thought that this video was salty.